Okay, when this round of slides is over, then we will um, start our regular meeting. Okay, Frank, thank you very much, everyone, and welcome to the Native Plant Society of Portland's June meeting. Uh, it seems like a good evening uh, to be inside as I look at the deluge out my window. Uh, my name is Lisa Schall, and I'm a volunteer with the Native Plant Society and have been the treasurer for several years now and am, um, I guess, one of the iNaturalist coordinators for all of our BioBlitz. Um, the Native Plant Society promotes the enjoyment, knowledge, and protection of all of Oregon's native plants. And we'd certainly, uh, especially like to welcome any new members or visitors tonight to our meeting. As part of our mission, we present a speaker each month on timely topics. And actually, we're hoping that tonight's speaker is not a timely topic. I think we're done with fires for a while. But in just a few minutes, Chris Adlam, uh, we'll talk about good fire and revitalizing indigenous burning from the Salish Sea to the Sierra Nevada. Uh, first, just some reminders about our Zoom etiquette. Uh, please have your both your mic your uh, and your video off, your cameras off, uh, until we get to our social hour at the end. Um, and we'll certainly be able to talk and have questions for our speaker also um, towards the end. Uh, he did say that he had a discussion question uh, partway through, so he'll prompt us when we're ready for that. Uh, any questions that you have, please put in the chat and one of our um, board members will write that down and pose them to Chris uh, when we get to that point in our program. Uh, looking ahead to July, as I said, we will not be having a regular meeting but now with COVID somewhat on the back burner, uh, we will be having an outside members picnic at Mary S. Young Park in West Lynn. And that is on July 24th 
and you can check your uh, calicordis for more information on that. Uh, please also check your calicordis for our, our mini hikes that we will be having uh, in July. And we're having yet another bio blitz. This time it's alpine wildflowers. So um, we did try a June burn one, but are having a hard time finding the actual mapping coordinates to narrow it down to just the burned areas. Um, <clears throat> so with that, I would like to um, tell a little bit more about our speaker tonight. Chris Adlam is part of the OSU Extension Fire Program team. He's working right now in Southwest Oregon and in this position, he helps communities live well with fire through greater understanding of its ecological role of diverse management options. His doctoral work at UC Davis focused on the revitalization of cultural burning in California. He worked with members of the North Fork Mono, Winton, Karuk, Maidu, and Yurok tribes in California and the Klamath and Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians in Oregon. He resides in Applegate uh, area. So that's a beautiful place in Oregon if you haven't been there. Um, if you want some more information, he will put um, a link um, probably to one of the home pages in the Oregon State University. Um, but they, um, I, as I was kind of poking around, found these Wildfire Wednesday um, presentations that they've been doing weekly. So if you want to know more on this subject, we can put some of those links in there as well. Uh, he's, there's uh, podcasts and PDFs, and he even has a blog. So with that, I would like to uh, turn it over to Chris Adlam and um, let's find out what he has been doing with FIRE how he plays with fire. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah, the Extension Fire Program is a pretty new program and we have specialists in uh, all regions throughout Oregon. Um, I am the specialist for Southwest Oregon and I would love to introduce you to the specialist for your region, the Willamette Valley North Cascades. But unfortunately, that position is currently vacant. We are in the final stages of hiring a new specialist. And I, I hope that that person will be someone that you might have as a speaker in the future of talking about whatever they turn out to be uh, particularly interested in talking about. There are so many vast aspects of fire and uh, each of the specialists in, in each different region has sort of a different um, kind of emphasis we have some people who are a little bit more on the rangeland side and some people who are a little bit more on the forestry side and some people a little bit more on prescribed fire. And um, one of the things that I uh, work on quite a lot and given my background is working with tribes on collaboratively finding ways forward um, to manage the landscape in ways that respect traditional ecological knowledge. So I'm going to start my presentation. Where's my presentation? Here it is. So like Lisa said, I wanna talk about this movement that is happening right now of revitalizing indigenous cultural burning practices and um, We'll talk about some examples from Washington State down to California. And, uh, you know, we all are very concerned about fire these days. It's on a lot of people's minds. Um, and part of this conversation has been around what do we do to, what, what do we need to change in the way that we interact with fire? Um, what, and one thing that comes up often is what have indigenous people done, right? And the topic of burning comes up. And so I do think it is timely in the sense of we're seeing a, a high level of interest in indigenous people's burning practices across the, the West. 
Um, before I go further, I, I also want to add my acknowledgement of the, the people of the Applegate Valley, the Dekubitidi, and the nearby tribes of the Tequilma and Shasta people. And um, many of their descendants, you know, were removed forcibly in 1856 to the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and Confederated T Tribes of Silets Indians reservations. Um, but as we shall see, the connection uh, that they have to this landscape in Southern Oregon, um, while it has been damaged, has not been severed. And it is my hope that we can continue to work with people who have lived in these places for thousands of years to better understand our place in the natural world and to work in partnership to um, move towards a better relationship with, with each other and with the places that we call home. Let's go back a little bit. Let's take this, take the long view. If we go back, we find that people have been using fire for a very long time. People have probably used fire for half a million to two million years about. That's to say that our ancestors have been using fire since before Homo sapiens existed. So it is absolutely a huge part of our species. It has shaped us in ways that um, really make us who we are. The use of fire for cooking in particular enabled us to eat softer food and get more nutrition out of that food. That meant that we didn't have to have jaws that were as big and instead our brains could get bigger and we could start to use more tools and develop more complex language and cultures. During this time that people were using fire for cooking, people were also spreading fire across the land and altering ecosystems. ecosystems. It's difficult to know how far back landscape firing has occurred, but probably for about as long as people have known about fire, they've been setting fire to the landscape for some purpose or another. People across the world today still use fire. We have indigenous cultures in many parts of the world, like Australia and the tropical savannas of Africa, South America, and even places like Europe. We find people like the Basque herders in the Pyrenees use fire on a very frequent basis um, to manage their landscapes and uh, manage their pastures. So fire has had a profound impact on our species and on the environments that we live in. Here too, that is true of the indigenous people of the west coast of, the, of North America. This is a tree that you can see here that's in the, the Applegate Valley where I live and it is a dead pine tree. It's probably been dead for quite a long time, decades at least. Um, and you can see that it's got a, a very particular scar. This is called a fire scar or a cat face scar. And if you look carefully inside of that fire scar, that cat face, you see these layers. And these layers are not growth rings. These are successive fires that left an imprint on this tree. So every time a fire came, it would burn back the edge of the scar, and then the tree would start healing over again. And a few years later, it would burn back again, the edge, and then it would start growing again. And this happened, you can see the red arrows, it happened about 15 times on this tree. You can see there's very little space in between successive fire scars because fire probably occurred every three to five years about. The last fire on the outside of the trees is probably about 1850, 1855-ish, right? Coinciding with the forced removal of indigenous people from the area. And each of the fires inside of that is probably a fire that was ignited by indigenous people in this place as part of their seasonal rounds, gathering acorns and hunting. 
So people here too have left a mark on the landscape and we can still see the signs of that when we know how to look for them. At this time, I would like to reflect with you on the term cultural burning. If you wouldn't mind putting in the chat, what does it bring to mind for you? A question, um, a feeling or a thought, a short sentence? Feel free to put that in the chat and just, what does it bring up to you? It's, it's sort of an intriguing idea that people set fire to the landscape deliberately. You know, we, we tend to discourage that nowadays. Smokey Bear. So what does that, what does the, what do those two words together mean to you? Cultural burning. Yeah. A lot of different thoughts in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm not going to read them all out loud, but I, I appreciate you think, thinking about this with me and putting your thoughts in, into the chat and a lot of different things come up and that's really great. I, like, I love to see the diversity of things that come up for people. So I'm not going to talk too much about why people burn and what this practice means to indigenous people, because I think the best person to talk about that would probably be an indigenous practitioner. Um, and I'm going to take the direction of talking about partnerships with indigenous people that have um, really worked to support the use of fire and how can non-Indigenous people, non-Indigenous organizations support lives in realizing the use of their traditional knowledge. But for some background, some of the reasons that people use fire, and this is a photo from California burning off a, a small meadow in the Sierra Nevada uh, with the North Fork Mono tribe, people, People use fire for a, a diversity of reasons. One uh, of reason is that people used to light fires for hunting to scare game into areas where they could be killed. Um, doing, for example, circle drives, um, that sort of thing. People also though use fire to attract the same game animals by creating habitat for them. For example, burning off old patches of, of shrubs that are not as tasty for deer and elk and then recreating a fresh flush of growth that is uh, richer in protein and more nutritious for those animals. So thereby increasing the available habitat and quantity of game species. People use fire to protect important trees and important habitats so burning underneath oak trees to reduce their vulnerability to hot fires, burning off meadows to keep trees from coming into those meadows and uh, taking over the meadows that provide important sustenance for many species, including people. People use fire to rejuvenate plants, plants like basketry plants or berry bushes that over time become twisted and brittle and less productive, then they will burn those and they will come back fresh with, with healthy, uh, being able to produce berries and nuts or, or basketry materials, depending on the plant species. People of course use fire to protect their homes and villages. And 
they also burn along trails to keep travel corridors open. Um, it used to be that there were trails along all rivers, pretty much along ridge lines, all over the mountains, all over the hills. And people would use these seasonally to visit relatives or to trade or to go hunting or gathering or for spiritual purposes. And as they came back, they would uh, light these areas off to keep them open. Those are some utilitarian reasons why people use fire. There are also a lot of non-utilitarian reasons, things that are sort of intangible, right? A lot of people, if you go around the world and you ask people why they burn, the number one reason it turns out is, while well, they're cleaning up, they're, they're cleaning up, right? And this is something I really think about a lot because it seems vague or imprecise or, or something, you know, what does that mean, cleaning up? Does nature need to be cleaned up? But when I really think about that, what it evokes to me is the fact that people know what it needs to, what it looks like to them when the land is tended in a proper way. And they want the land to look like that. And if you ask them in more detail, they'll probably tell you, well, yeah, it's for this plant and it's for that animal. And there'll, there'll be a lot of complexity that will come up. But that first initial reaction, oftentimes people have done surveys all over the world. And the first thing that comes up is people are cleaning up. It's just part of what they do. It's part of their culture. It's part of how they see the environment. So it's sort of an aesthetic. It's just part of people's culture and relationship to that place. People also have used fire for ceremonial burns, burning off areas, sometimes annually as part of landscape scale, ritual practices. People burn today to connect to their ancestral practices. They want to burn because this is part of who they are as an indigenous person. And lastly, it's a spiritual obligation for many people to tend the landscape. They, some tribes have stories that, you know, creator instructed them to take care of the land in this way. And so they feel that it is an obligation that they have to take care of the land and to see it made whole and healthy through the knowledge that was passed down to them by their ancestors. All of this together, these tangible reasons for burning, these less tangible reasons for burning, mean that there was just, for a long time before colonization and fire suppression, there was just a lot of fire. In a lot of places around the West, there was a lot of fire. It's a little bit difficult for us to imagine just how much fire was on the landscape. But that also meant that when fires burned, they were a lot less intense in many places. We've heard this often said about the Willamette Valley. There's a very good uh, record of people burning the Willamette Valley, possibly as much as annually in many places, burning large swaths of the Willamette Valley, the Kalapuya tribe did, for the oak trees, the health of the oak trees, and for keeping prairies open, for game species, for the harvest of various culturally important species, camas, grasshoppers and so on. But some places we're finding now something similar was happening and we didn't really appreciate this until recently. This is a place here. I was there a couple of days ago. It's called Jim's Creek and it's on the middle fork of the Willamette River. And that's uh, just south of Oak Ridge, about, well, about an hour south of Oak Ridge going up towards, um, what is it, Diamond, uh, yeah, sort of eventually goes towards Diamond Lake if you keep going on that gravel road over the pass. And this is, you can see, it doesn't look like the Western Cascades, really, does it? It's uh, an open pine oak savanna. Historically, there was about 20 trees per acre, 20 to 30 trees per acre. Very few trees, but very large trees, very large pines, massive pines, some of the biggest I've seen. 
And in this place, you can see that the Forest Service has actually done some restoration. They've uh, cut some of the smaller trees that, that grew up since 18, the 1850s and um, restored it back to something resembling the historical structure. They left the old pines and the old oaks. Um, and hopefully that, that, will be, that will be healthier for those pine trees that were slowly dying out. And this, the reason this place was this way is because people were burning it. People were burning it every about three to five years. There's a trail that goes over the mountains and uh, Klamath uh, tribal members would come over and hunt the elk in the Eugene areas and trade with the Kalapuyas. Uh, the Molalas would be uh, in this area. There's a, a village not too far. And as people move through this landscape, one thing that was going on, they were harvesting bark from these pine trees. So this is uh, on the left, this is a culturally modified tree. People harvested the bark. And um, I was there with some, some researchers, including uh, David Lewis of the Grand Ronde tribe, from the Grand Ronde tribe. He's looking at why people were, were harvesting the bark in this way. Uh, the bark of ponderosa pine is used for food, but it seems like people were also taking some of the wood underneath, possibly for other purposes, maybe making, making uh, small baskets or something to pick berries into. And so this landscape was just inhabited thoroughly, you know, and people were using fire very frequently. Um, even in places like this, like the Western Cascades. Uh, this is not representative, of course, of all of the Western Cascades by any means, but there are places uh, like this. And that's uh, very interesting to me. and something that we haven't appreciated um, in the past. One of the things that really gives me pause is that when people were burning in this way, the types of fires that we see today in many places simply uh, did not exist, at least not in the dry forests where fire would have been a lot more common, but a lot less intense. But people weren't burning primarily for that reason. The, the, the fuels reduction was essentially a byproduct of their culture and their cultural relationship with this landscape and with fire. Right. And so that's something that I, I really think about, that that relationship mitigated the risk of high severity fires without people having to, to really think about that too much. That was just kind of a secondary byproduct. Right. And so I, I think about that because it makes me think, what is... What is a fire culture? I don't, I didn't grow up in a culture that has a fire culture. I grew up like probably most of you thinking wildfires were bad and scary. And the more I learned about fire's benefits and the fact that there are people who have lived for thousands of years with an appreciation of those benefits, that's really, caused me to rethink a lot of things and to ask myself, what is a fire culture and how is that maintained? How is that passed on? And if we want to move towards having a healthier relationship with fire as a society, what do we need to do? Um, and I think the first thing we need to do is understand the fire cultures of indigenous people and support indigenous people in their efforts to revitalize their own fire cultures. Fire culture, so this, the rest of this talk, I wish I could just show you photos of plants. I'm a plant nerd and I know there's a few others in the room, but you know, I'm gonna kind of talk about people here a lot more than I'm going to talk about plants. And I am not an expert on people. I'm an ecologist. I am not trained in people things. Um, and I am also much less an indigenous person. So 
this is going to be my efforts to understand how people fit into a holistic view of restoring the landscape, restoring the forest, restoring our relationship to these places. So going back to the fire culture thing, what really is interesting to me is that there's a lot of conversation right now about where and when and how to burn. A recent article in CNN said, we should listen to native people because they know where and when and how to burn, right? Well, I read that and I thought, well, that's somewhat true, but is that the deeper lesson of people who have a fire culture? That seems like the tip of the iceberg is where and when and how to burn. People, who have this type of fire culture, this type of relationship with fire over a long time, long period of time intergenerationally, they pass down that knowledge through values and norms, through experiential learning in a lifelong way, um, which develops to them this, this intuition of, we have to burn this because we need to clean it up. All of that is maintained through social connections, connections to elders, connections to peers, and again, these lifelong experiences that people have and ongoing dialogue, dialogue with, with others who uh, use these practices, dialogue with people maybe from other cultures and all of this, this fire culture, that is the thing that we as Western people, I, that my culture, we do not have this. And yet, what we're seeing now with the interest in cultural burning and revitalizing this practice, we're seeing these partnerships emerging between native and non-native people who understand that our relationship with fire needs to change. And so how do we, as people who lack this fire culture, support people who have it in being able to revitalize it and bring it back? This is a challenge and it seems like a very interesting challenge to me. And so this is what I'm going to talk about. And I'm gonna give you some examples of some partnerships that people, um, of between native and non-native people to um, support the use of cultural burning. We're gonna start north and we're gonna work our way south. And this is a partnership here between the Chehalis tribe and the Eco Studies Institute, and they're burning on the Chehalis Reservation. This is a, a, an important gathering area for the tribe. Um, there are camas, camas and other important uh, cultural plants here. And people hadn't used fire for, well, several generations at this point. Um, and meanwhile, the Eco Studies Institute was working with a variety of other institutions, organizations, and agencies to burn the Puget Sound prairies. And so when they made this connection with the Chehalis tribe, um, they were in a position to bring that experience to try and figure out how they can support the tribe in being able to realize their objective of burning this prairie. There are a lot of obstacles to that. The way that we approach fire and sort of the, the sort of standard federal model nowadays is not really friendly to the values of tribes, right? It's very uh, top down and very, um, everybody has to wear the uniform and uh, there are obstacles like needing to get insurance and uh, there's just all sorts of things. You can't have, say, uh, children or elders on the fire. That wouldn't be safe, right? Well, in a culture of fire, that's difficult to not have elders and children on a burn because how do you pass on knowledge in a cultural way without elders and fire uh, and children on a fire? So in this case, you can see that they managed to, to tweak the rules a little bit. And you can see that there are community members in the background on this burn. And um, 
I think that it was a, a very positive experience. And, and this is um, William Toms from the Department of Natural Resources. I believe he, he's with the yeah, DNR at the, the Chehalis tribe. He said he's, he's seen people go into this burn area after it was burned and see the fresh grass coming up and the fresh plants coming up and people didn't used to go there, you know? And uh, so that was really a, a successful thing to him was seeing that people were now reconnecting to this place. Another really interesting and innovative partnership uh, that's happening right now is taking place in the South Willamette Valley. And it's a partnership between uh, the Silets and Grand Ronde tribes and the Long Tom Watershed Council. Um, Katie McKendrick from the Long Tom Watershed Council has been the, the main coordinator um, and the Eco Studies Institute again. And um, this is a really interesting project that has been providing training to tribal members to get certified as firefighters, entry-level firefighters using the federal qualification system. Uh, this will allow people to then be able to burn, for example, on federal lands, such as uh, the National Wildlife Refuges in the Valley. And Another thing that they're doing is that they're going to be buying an engine and hiring an all indigenous crew uh, to staff that engine. And then that module will be able to support burns for fuels reduction, for prescribed burning, for ecological purposes, or for cultural burning, uh, wherever people need uh, those burns to take place. And so this is a very, very exciting uh, development because in prescribed fire, we always struggle with having enough people to burn because most people, there are a lot of firefighters, but there are not that many fire lighters. And uh, oftentimes the people who are fire lighters are also firefighters. And so then they go off on wildfires and there's nobody left to burn. Um, so this is providing more capacity for burning, but it's doing that by first and foremost, elevating the original users of prescribed fire, the tribes. And I think that that is a, a really inspiring example of honoring where this knowledge comes from. A lot of people wanna do prescribed burning nowadays, but ultimately that knowledge comes from indigenous people. And I think that recognizing that the way that this partnership does is, is very important. And I also really appreciate this project because it really, it centers tribal communities and it understands that this is long-term work. This is relationship building. This is about people's relationship to one another. It's about working across cultures. It's about people's connection to place. And it's about recognizing that if we want to restore the landscapes of the Willamette Valley that were created through this relationship for thousands of years, we need people to be a part of that. And I, I love this, this picture is a little grainy, but you see at the end of the day after the burn uh, at the Andrew Reasoner Preserve, you can see that uh, people are sitting around the fire, cooking salmon and sharing stories. And this is, this is what fire culture looks like, I think, I think. People are talking about the things they did that day, things that worked, things that didn't, things that maybe some other people would have done differently and imbuing this experience with meaning and connecting to this place, knowing that they will come back to this place and gather hazel and gather other bulbs and other plants. Next example is uh, down in my region in the Rogue Valley, it's the Indigenous Gardens Network, which is a collaboration between those same tribes, the Siletz and Grand Ronde. Uh, folks at Southern Oregon University, Brooke Colley and Ariel Halpern, and various natural areas of the Rogue Valley, um, and organizations like the Nature Conservancy, Southern Oregon Land Conservancy, Vesper Meadow, 
And the goal of this organization is to provide access to land for uh, tribal members who are descendants of the people of these places, you know. Um, and so it's, it's helping people who maybe haven't had the chance to connect to these landscapes to be able to come here uh, to the land where their ancestors are buried and, and, and be here. Um, it's providing that opportunity and, uh, and it's elevating indigenous leadership in the process, right? Indigenous people are the, need to be in the driver's seat as it were, right? I mean, this is, it's their, it's their ancestral land and it's their experience and it's their culture. So how do we allow people to shape their own experience but also remove the obstacles, remove the burdens, right? If all of the organizations involved in this network were to individually contact tribes, people would just be snowed under and they'd be like, oh, great. hey, come to Table Rocks whenever you like, all right? Hey, come to Vespa Meadows. We'll let you come and gather cameras. It would be, it wouldn't work, right? I mean, it would be too much and, it wouldn't really address the issues. So the network is seeking not only to just open up these lands in a passive way, but to actually understand what the obstacles are for people, understand what they need and provide them the resources they need to be able to connect to these places. So they've gotten grants to support travel costs for people and lodging. Um, they've done uh, cultural trainings for folks in the network to better understand the tribe's history and culture. Um, and it's really the, the attention to detail and, and to these, again, long-term relationships is something that I've appreciated in, in my time working with this network of people. And another thing that I really appreciate is how it, this, project really understands people as whole persons, right? Um, culture is, is complicated and people are complicated and, and there isn't a simple answer as to what, how to fix this. There isn't a solution. Colonization was brutal. People were, you know, forcibly displaced. There's a lot of trauma. We're not gonna fix this, but how do we take a step in, in the right direction? Um, in this photo, this is the Rogue River Preserve near uh, the foot of Table Rocks. And, um, you know, it's, it's really important healing work for people to be able to connect to these places, to their ancestral lands, but it can also bring up complicated emotions. In this case, we were at a site that according to historic maps, is the location of a massacre in 1856, right? And so people are having to, you know, in reconnecting to their landscapes, they also have to confront that part of, of their history that is pretty brutal and, and traumatic. Um, and maybe they discover that, you know, there are plants there that they, they don't know the names of and they don't know the uses for because they didn't have the chance to grow up in this place and neither did their parents or maybe grandparents, you know? And so that disconnect can create a lot of complicated emotions and uh, the Indigenous Gardens Network has been really wonderful, I think, in creating space for people to process that and, um, and really be in the driver's seat as to their own experience and how they want that to, to unfold. One last example is one that I was involved in during my uh, PhD at the University of California, Davis. And this was a project called Keepers of the Flame. And we took our students, we had a class and we took our students out to these Native American communities. Um, we worked with some folks in, uh, in the Central Valley and in the Sierra Nevada who were doing cultural burns. Uh, the students really loved it because they didn't get very many opportunities for experiential learning. <laughs> um, and the, the people we worked with really wanted to share 
sort of why cultural burning was important to them. They wanted people to be able to see why this is an important part of their culture, why it makes such a difference to them that they, to be able to use fire for the health of the plants that they interact with and the places that they work in. Um, we held two indigenous fire workshops, one in this place, this is the tendering, Tending and Gathering Garden in uh, Woodland, which is in the Central Valley near Davis. And this was an old gravel pit that was restored. They restored it to a wetland and part of it they restored using cultural plants that were important for local native practitioners, including the deer grass that people are burning here under the supervision of uh, Diana Almendaries, who's a Wintun elder. And you can see there's quite a lot of people and, and people are involved in various ways and not everybody's wearing a uniform and it's fine, it's okay, it's safe. Everybody's having a good time. The smoke's going up, it's going away from people. Everybody's feeling good. Maybe this is a little bit what a fire culture looks like. Our next indigenous fire workshop we did was in Mariposa with Ron Good from the North Fork Mono tribe. And Ron has been burning in this place for many years now. It's the site of a 8,000 year old Miwok village that probably at one point um, was home for six to 800 people, a pretty large village site. And uh, people come from a long way to gather here. And uh, some of the plants that they're really interested in are the sourberry, Rus aromatica, or three leaf sumac, or skunk bush, or lemonade berry. It's got lots of names. And people pick the berries uh, to make food. Uh, they make a, a beverage out of it. Um, you can also eat them uh, the way they are. They're very sour. It's really, really interesting. And people also use it for basketry. People also use the red bud for basketry. And there are many other plants and oak trees, gray pines that people gather as well. And you can see that it's really a social event, that photo on, on the lower right. You know, people are sitting around, the elders are showing how to peel the red bud sticks. Um, and people are talking and exchanging stories. And maybe sometime they'll walk over to the where people are burning and, and give them a hard time and then, you know, go back to chatting. And this is, this is also maybe what a fire culture looks like. That's how knowledge is shared and, and passed on. So one of the big questions that we had in this project, you know, we were, we were also doing research, you know, this was a community-based participatory research project among other things. Uh, but we, we wanted to focus on providing an experience that you know, everybody felt good about and we wanted that research to kind of emerge out of it. We didn't wanna be intrusive with our research. We wanted to do research with people, not research on people. And our main question was how can non-native people and organizations support this work of cultural burning? And we wrote an article about it with uh, some of the ideas that came out of this workshop. In these photos on the right, you can see from the top, we were burning in 2017. And then, nope, nope, 2018 anyway. And then two years later, you can see these mono weavers were gathering that uh, red bud. See how much it grew in two years, pretty amazing. And they were gathering that for basketry. So what are some of the lessons that we learned and what, what, what are some of the takeaways? For me, all this, this is about, it has to start in, with dialogue. It's, it's cultural burning sometimes we imagine it is, it is described as something that's sort of fixed in the past. It's people used to burn a certain way. And that was, you know, so 200 years ago, the world has changed. Why is it still relevant? You know, you hear that sometimes. 
But that's a misunderstanding because knowledge is dynamic. Uh, ecolog traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous people no less. It is dynamic, it is changing over time, and it is something that is acquired through lifelong experiences and sharing knowledge with one another and comparing observations. And so the act of dialogue is where the learning happens. That learning, there isn't a knowledge out there that's waiting to be discovered. And if there is knowledge that people have that's specific, it's not our place to go out there and try and chase it down to write an article or a book about it, you know, that's maybe how some research was done in the past, but we've been trying to move away from that model of research. Now we need to be co-learners. We need to learn together with people and not try and extract knowledge from people. So that act of dialogue, that is how we make sense together. That's how we make places together. The other thing is that on the heels of that, it's important to learn from other people and that's how we become better partners and allies. But we need to do that in an ethical way. With knowledge comes responsibility, especially in indigenous cultures. I think it's fair to say that people passing on knowledge, there's, a, there's an expectation that you are gonna be responsible with that knowledge. The knowledge that's been shared with me personally motivates me to try and do what I can to now make sure that knowledge is passed on and, and keeps, stays alive and stays in that community with the people where it originated. Reciprocity is another important concept in a lot of indigenous cultures, I think it's fair to say. And for knowledge that is exchanged, I think it's important to figure out how we can give back for that. And again, not be sort of consumers of knowledge. And uh, yeah. Another thing that we learn in our projects uh, when I was at, in Davis um, with the Keepers of the Flame project, uh, it's really important work to reflect on our own relationships to place on our own worldviews um, and acknowledge that indigenous people have their own relationships to place and their own worldviews. Um, we described in our article, the people have an indigenous, indigenous people have a fire ethic, a little bit like Aldo Leopold's land ethic, but a fire ethic and people approach fire with in a very different way than the culture that I'm part of, right? That relationship is based on respect and reciprocity. Diana Elmendariz says, you know, when she turns on the news and sees people are talking about fire, like it's destructive and it's ravaging the land and we need to fight it. You know, she says, I'm not surprised that fire is acting out. Listen to how they're talking about it. I would be acting the same way. Um, and that really stuck with me because uh, it's true, our culture, my culture, um, that's kind of the default is fire is sort of the enemy, right? And um, perhaps if we learn to see fire in all of its complexity and the many benefits that it creates, even wildfires have many benefits. Maybe if we could see those and appreciate those, um, maybe our relationship with fire would shift a little. And the thing that really, really, I find, find very interesting as, a, as a, not, a, not an expert on people and culture, but as a student, um, that there's a social and cultural context that is so important to all of this. And so when we talk about where, when, and how to burn, like some of these news articles, that's looking over the fact that there's all of this, this context, there are stories and this language and ceremonies and norms are passed down and shared among generations and across families, um, between tribes as well. 
you know, all of this is the bedrock foundation, the fertile ground through which this relationship with fire uh, emerges. And that all is work that we need to nurture. And I think that the projects that I talked about earlier, the ones that I've been involved with and the others as well that I mentioned, um, they've done a really good job of acknowledging the importance of that cultural context, the importance to nurture that cultural context, that social context uh, that is the basis of people's relationship to fire and relationship to the land. That also invites us to think about, I think our own social connections and cultural context around fire. Do we have stories about the benefits of fire as non-native people? Um, do we have opportunities for people to see a prescribed burn happen and learn about the benefits? Do we even have opportunities for people to um, take part in a prescribed burn? It's not impossible. We can do that in some places that's available, but not very often. So of course our stories around fire tend to be very negative um, because we don't have those kinds of experiences with people. So I believe that we can learn to be better partners and better learners. And those two things really happen together, actually. I think that working with indigenous people is you know, su supporting the work of indigenous people is, the ac is actually the way to learn about their culture in a way that is respectful and not extractive, right? Um, and it's a way to learn about ourselves and our own culture in comparison and how we treat fire in a very different way. So I'll leave you with this quote uh, from Danny Manning, who's a Maidu fire practitioner. He says, you take care of the fire, the fire takes care of the land, and the land takes care of you. So it is my hope that in supporting the work of indigenous people, we can also learn how to live sustainably in this place, um, in the right and a good relationship with fire. I'm going to, whoops, stop my share. Um, and I apologize, I wasn't checking the chat, but I will, um, I am happy to uh, see what, I see some, some things popping up in the chat. That's either forwards or backwards, either way. Oh, well, I see a question from Lisa about field burning and, uh, you know, uh, yes, yes, field burning, uh, people have to use more chemicals now because um, of not using field burning. Um, it's everybody's, you know, I suppose you can, you can make your own cho choice as to whether that's a trade-off that's worth it. You know, certainly the smoke from field burning in the Willamette Valley was inconveniencing a lot of people, I think it's fair to say. Um, but uh, also using chemicals is not great for, for some, for, for, for a lot of people, I think it's fair to say too. So uh, there are places in Oregon where people still do burn agriculturally, Um, and uh, Douglas County is an example where ranchers use pasture burning. Uh, and uh, until recently, people were burning 20,000 acres a year. So really not insignificant. And that practice is really declining now though, for various reasons. Um, so certainly we do see that some non-indigenous communities adopted the practice of burning possibly because their ancestors learned that directly from indigenous people, I, I suspect in many cases. 
Um, so that's that's one one question. Uh, are there any allowances being made with OSHA for indigenous fire restorers? Uh, OSHA, well, OSHA being uh, sort of regulating um, um, sort of employee relationships, employer employee relationships. I think that doesn't really apply so much. Um, As um indigenous people and, and who self-govern, are mm -hmm. they able to bypass some of the other regulations? Yeah, so I think it, it depends on where this is happening, right? If people are burning on private land, um, you can kind of do what you want as long as you follow the permits. There's no regulations about needing, I don't know, specific, um, yeah, th that stuff is mostly unregulated for private land burning. Um, then on federal lands, there are specific requirements uh, having to do with um, federal regulations. And then if people are burning on tribal lands, then things look again a little bit differently because that goes through the BIA or possibly tribes are managing that themselves. Um, so it, I'm trying to think. I think in most cases, a lot of things are possible, right? I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of these rules can be bent one way or the other, even if they, they exist. And so um, with the right kind of dialogue and communication, these things, are, all these things are possible. But if, if people don't have goodwill, then they can make life difficult for people, that's for sure. Um, I see another question here. Since indigenous burning has become somewhat of a buzz phrase in the public discourse around fire management, have you seen instances of non-native, non-professional people doing it on their own in a misguided, ill-advised, unsanctioned way with good intentions but negative results? Um, you know, I think no, I, I haven't seen that happen. I think that what I have seen is that people are earnestly grappling with, with the, these truths that people have you know, burned these landscapes for many thousands of years. And that doesn't give you a simple answer like, oh, well, great, we're all gonna run out and burn. Well, you know, I mean, sure, but that's gonna be a little bit difficult. You're gonna need to learn how to get a permit. You're gonna need to learn a lot of skills. You're gonna need to get some equipment. Um, there are not that many people that I know of, at least that are going out there and doing it in a way that is careless and, and um, or you know dangerous. In fact, what I see is people coming together and um, forming associations like prescribed burn associations to seek training, to seek equipment and to work with qualified professionals to figure out how to do this in a way that's sustainable. Uh, many of these associations have uh, some relationship to tribes in different places like in California and um, have been also benefiting from that perspective. So we don't have we don't have people going out and just burning things in, 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 in that sort of way or around here. I'm glad to say uh, I, I can't think of any examples of that. So um, hopefully it's, it's a positive, empowering thing and not, not a reckless, you know, uh, yeah, kind of situation. Would burning undertaken by indigenous peoples have brought individuals who normally wouldn't be interacting very much together? I am thinking of fire potentially covering areas that were shared among people, and these people otherwise would have gone about their lives without much interaction. That is a wonderful question. That is a wonderful question because um, we know that a lot of times people's, you know, the concept of territories, Aboriginal territories, very modern concept, right? That the government created that. Historically, people's people were overlapping everywhere. You'd have a, a Karuk village here and there'd be a Shasta village next to it and then there'd be another Karuk village or whatever. Um, people didn't have these hard boundaries. Uh, so I can only imagine that at times of year they would come together 
and burn together. I don't know of any specific historical cases where that's sort of been documented, but I have a hard time imagining that it wasn't in fact pretty normal for people to be able to, to come together and burn together. Um, of course, a lot of burning maybe was also happening at family levels. So a family would burn around their oak trees or specific patch of plants. So not all burns required sort of whole communities to come together. But today, again, we see that happen with, with now people are rising to this challenge and trying to burn together and, and do it in a proper way. And we do see people coming together. I was just reading an article yesterday about ranchers in Nebraska who are forming prescribed burn associations to burn the prairies out there that are being lost to Eastern red cedar, which is a juniper, funnily enough. And so they get together and they burn and they burn, you know, big areas and they just burn off all of those trees that are taking over uh, prairies. And one of the people interviewed was saying, you know, they, they never used to get together anymore with their neighbors and, and, and everything. And now they come together and they do these burns together. And it's a very social thing. And I've seen that in California where you have, you know, uh, just old timey ranchers and hippies and like city slickers and pot growers and everybody's getting together in Humboldt County and you know, all burning together. And these people would never be caught dead talking to one another on the street, but they're all working together side by side for this purpose. It's really actually kind of inspiring. You mentioned that fuel reduction is a byproduct. Is there any movement to integrating fuel reduction into cultural burning? You know, I think not in the sense that people now, for cultural burning to be possible, sometimes you need to actually do fuels reduction first in the sense that otherwise it's not, the land is not ready for that. It does not present itself in a way that people would be able to use that knowledge. And so there is a distinction that I've, I hear people making more and more, in fact, you know, it was before it was quite vague when people were talking about cultural burning and prescribed fire. Now people are increasingly differentiating the two. And so now I've heard people talk about even within tribes that said, we're going to go and do a prescribed burn over here. And once the fuels have been reduced, then we'll be able to do cultural burns. And I think one of the differences is that the, the prescribed burns are usually very, mm, directed by sort of kind of an agency mentality and everybody's got their radios and it's very, uh, you know, very professional, but also sort of not the same kind of connection that people have to fire and to what's happening, right? And then the cultural burn on the other hand is uh, more family-based. People will, will be there with their families and their friends and they'll, they'll be doing these little burns and the flames don't get very big because there's not much to burn because they do it often enough. So um, that's kind of the direction it's going right now. A lot of prescribed burning and then hopefully getting back to cultural burning as a maintenance after that. With Native Americans dispossessed from their lands for so many generations, how are cultural burning practices known other than legacy of modified landscape such as unusually large trees, et cetera? That's a good question too. Um, you know, I think that we, obviously a lot of specifics have been lost. It is fair to say that a lot of the tribes today that are revitalizing this, this practice don't remember what song or what ceremony is associated with burning a particular area, for example, right? And so they're making up new protocols. Um, and figuring out how to do this in a way that makes sense to them today. Uh, but that's part of culture. That's part of the fact that, no, this knowledge is dynamic. It's not fixed in one way and people can reinvent things. And that's just, you know, we don't have to live in 1850 forever. Right? And people are, people are coming up with new things and using their values and their knowledge that comes from stories that comes from elders and that they're, they're using that to inform their practice and sometimes it maybe ends up looking very much like it did in times 
gone by and sometimes it maybe looks a bit different, but that's, that's okay because this is 2022 and you know, people are creative that way and generative. Um, but, you know, I would say that there are people like that there are indigenous uh, fire scientists like Frank Lake. I'm sure some of you have heard about Frank Lake, probably many of you. Frank Lake has written lots of stuff about this. And it's amazing when you really start doing archival work and you combine that with looking at tree rings and you combine that with oral history, you can really piece things together and start to put together a very interesting picture of how things were sometimes when, when you can uh, do that research. Um, your comment on how the indigenous folks don't go around burning land brings up the awareness of how much arson is associated with rural communities. Do you think the colonizing masses are drawn to set fire to forests because they haven't been initiated in a rite of passage to be given permission to burn? I wonder. That's interesting, you know. Um, I recently learned about sport burning, and that is when people drive around the forest and they set fire to piles, like they, they find a pile from fuel reduction and they'll set, set it on fire and drive away. That's crazy. Uh, I was talking to uh, the Douglas Fire Protective Association about that. So arson, um, it happens, yeah. Um, I don't know that it's particularly enlightened, <laughs> but I would say that in other places, arson is a pretty interesting phenomenon, socioculturally. In Georgia, for example, um, Mike Colan at the University of Oregon did some research and he found that if you look at patterns of arson in Georgia, people are burning at a time of year that maximizes ecological benefits and they're burning in specific places that maximize ecological benefit. And when you look at it and you look at the people who do the arson, they're not criminals, they're actually just people who go out and they go, this place needs to burn right about now. And they set it on fire because the government's not doing that. And down there in the Southeast, people have the, just this culture around fire that the land needs to burn at a certain time in a certain way. And so um, when you look at that arson there, a lot of it is actually people who do have that urge to tend the landscape. Um, and I think this is a pattern that's in decline. It's not so much happening anymore, but it was a retrospective study going back you know, several decades. Um, I don't think people are burning, are doing arson for ecological purposes in Oregon, but I would love to get those people, if they are so interested in fire, they should join our prescribed burn association. We'll give them training. We'll tell them how to get a permit. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, is any part of fire culture starting to make sense to anyone outside the tribes? We, the colonizers, dealing with the destructive wildfires, our culture and forest practices are facilitated. You know, I think we, I'm, I hope that it is starting to make sense. Um, to people. I think that without the tribe's advocacy, we would be in a very different place today. We're very far from where we want to go, but laws are changing, making it easier to use prescribed fire. We have new programs that facilitate training for people and give them certifications. And we have a lot of momentum a lot of momentum. And I think that, especially in California, you see a lot of state bills in California that have been introduced to promote prescribed fire. And a lot of that is the advocacy of tribes. And so people in, tri in these tribes have been pushing for decades for more fire use. And I think that we're really seeing that change happening for that reason. And I think that a lot of people understand, and it's, it's not political. It's one of the few things we have anymore that's not divisive is like, yeah, Burning the land is healthy. I live in the Applegate. So I got neighbors who are hippies and I got neighbors who are just like right wing, you know, gunslingers. 
And I can talk to anybody and, and get a complete agreement that we need to use more fire on the landscape. I don't know that that comes from tribes. I don't know that people have sort of all read Cat Anderson, like I see a comment there, and have come to that conclusion. Um, but I do think that it is percolating, and, and I hope that we can come together around this issue because just fighting fires is not going to work. It is not working. And it is going to not work harder and harder every year. Things are going to get so much worse unless we can learn some of these lessons of how to care for, especially our dry forests. I know um, I'm talking to an audience in Portland and things are a little bit different on your doorstep, wetter forests that didn't necessarily used to have a lot of fire. So I'm putting that caveat out there, but a lot of the rest of the state, the Eastern Cascades and Southwest Oregon, we know that we need a lot more fire on the landscape if we wanna keep trees. And Nick, I, I went to UC Davis to study with Kat Anderson, uh, yet she retired. And I ended up working with one of her students, Beth Rose Middleton in Native American Studies, who is an absolutely wonderful human being. And so I had no regrets. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Uh, yeah, that book is impressive book. So uh, I'm sorry that it didn't work out, but I'm glad that it, uh, it did work out. Good job. Yeah. Yep. I'm happy to take any more questions if somebody wants to just turn on your camera. I'm, you know, I don't have anything. I know you have some things to talk about. So um, do you know the time period of natural fires in the Klamath and the Clackamas wet forests? Um, you know, I think that uh, moisture forests tend to burn in the fall during mm. offshore wind events just like the Tillamook burns, just like the 2020 Labor Day fires. Um, what's an interesting question is, how did that work out on the landscape historically? Because a lot of burning was happening in the Willamette Valley every year. A lot of burning was happening up on Mount Hood and up in the higher elevations for the huckleberries. And somewhere in between those things must have come together and I think our understanding is quite crude right now because for decades, scientists have said, well, the Western Cascades didn't burn very often, <laughs> once every several hundred years, maybe. And now we're going way to a minute. It's maybe a bit more complicated than that, but nevertheless, it would still predominantly burn in the fall. And, um, I'm not sure if that was your question, uh, Lisa, if that was, or, or you were asking how often. Um, and, no, and I, I think your answer was right on, right yeah. on target. <laughs> yeah. Will anyone else want to ask a verbal question of Chris? Uh, why do, hi, it's uh, Willow Elliot. Thank you, Chris. You are so, um, good at interpreting through, I can feel through your heart connection with the native people that you got it and they have you uh, as a great spokesperson to explain it to us, the other folks who haven't ever been around any native people. And I've been lucky enough to a few times. Um, so I'm just wondering who was, what was the first um, tribe that you did end up working with? Was it part of your UC Davis experience? Well, if you want the whole story, I uh, originally lived in Willamina and- Oregon. Uh, in Oregon, mm -hmm. and right next to the Grand Ronde tribe. And mm -hmm. I was interested in ethnobotany mm -hmm. and somebody said, you should go to the tribe and, and mm -hmm. tell them about your interests and see if they have any internships or projects that you could take part in. I said, mm -hmm. wow, talk to the tribe. Well, that's a bold idea. Mm -hmm. And so I went and uh, the tribal <laughs> ethnobotanist said, why don't you go to um, get a PhD? Mm -hmm. 
Was that was that uh, Greg Archuleta? At, no, at the time it was Eric Thorsgaard. Uh -huh. And yeah, and and here's some reading, and uh, the reading was Cat Anderson, among other things. And so, well, I said maybe that's not a bad idea, and I ended up in Davis, and wow, the rest huh. is history. So. Yeah. That's how it started out, yeah. <laughs> Terrific. Say everybody else, if you especially are a new member of NPSO, go ahead and turn your camera on. Ask uh, Chris a question. If you're shy, you can just not ask a question, but you, we just like to know you're here. And yeah, um, Chris, you're getting uh, kudos in the chat. And I want to also reiterate what Willow said about um, that presentation was really showing the heart and soul and your understanding of the bigger picture. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, the kind words. Mm -hmm. I feel Chris, fortunate that I can work on things like this in my, in my position with the OSU fire program, so. Well, how did you end up getting back it, you didn't get a degree from there, but they came. Did they ask you to come and join their program? Oh, them? no, I asked them if I could join. They, uh, the, the program was brand new and it, it started up um, just after I got done with my degree. So uh -huh. it was a perfect timing. Yeah. And um, well, I've actually lived on the East Coast and I hear a Massachusetts accent. Is that correct? <laughs> no, no. Massachusetts isn't so bad. I like I like that accent. Uh, I I wanted to just ask a, a quick question. Maybe it's not so quick, but it seems to me as though uh, you know we're you alluded to this. We're so technologically focused, and um, now with these big fires doing a lot of property damage, uh, that uh, there's probably. I'm surprised there's as much interest in allowing a non-technological approach to uh, managing forests through fire. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if there's amount of, a certain amount of pushback that you've witnessed where people are like, no, we need to use the satellites. We need to use all the technology, uh, technology that we have and, and kind of a tendency to brush this native culture of fire uh, aside. Thank you. Well, I think we've tried the technological approach and that's what we've been doing for a hundred years. You know, it started out in the 1910s, a ranger would see smoke on the hill and he'd pack his mule and he'd go out there with a shovel and he would put that fire out mm -hmm. and that was it. Because right, right. And if you understand what your your perspective is, uh, you know, I, I and I appreciate your perspective, and, and I'm not saying it's I'm advocating for the technological mm. perspective. I'm just wondering if, in your you know experience, you've you've said, oh wow, these these people are really pushing back here. Let's try to talk to them a different way or something. Thank you. Oh, okay, so. I, I'm just, I think that people see the writing on the wall and people see that the technological approach has failed. People do not have faith in it. Well, I hate to say, but there's less and less faith in federal agencies uh, getting a grip on the situation. Uh, we, we do have, sometimes that comes up. I have, a, let's say some county commissioners I could think of who are very like, no, we just need to try harder to put these fires out. <laughs> And I'm going, oh, we've been trying so hard. You have no idea, but it's not working. And they're just like, no, we need to try harder. We need to throw more firefighters at it and more engines. And so it does happen, but um, it's, a, it's a dwindling perspective, I think, hopefully. I have a question, or actually, I got a couple if I can ask. Um, I'm having a difficult time visualizing how the the scale of some of these fires, of what is what is recommended. And you're talking about either you know the size of a of a family fire or a community fire, um, and 
and both the scale of them, how they are controlled, and the time of year. I know you talked about it was something about how it's going to be the most ecologically beneficial. Um, so that's part of what I, question. And then I'm thinking about if this were to be extrapolated into, you know, a, um, a regional area, into into in the Columbia River Gorge and into um, into the Willamette Valley anyway, what would you suggest? I mean, how would that, how would that work? Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess, um, and I, it's, I'm not talking about it's kind of individual people going out and doing that, but how that would be scaled up then to um, start to change the amount of disastrous wildfires we're having in this area. Yeah. Well, I think we need to recognize that wildfire is doing most of the work right now. Most of our fuels reduction work is being done by wildfires. And so we need to change our relationship to wildfires as part of it. And probably if wildfires start in May, June, maybe putting them out is not the wisest thing okay. because we can take them to a specific ridge line a little further away or over to this road, you know, use those as prescribed fires essentially mm -hmm. in places where that's possible, maybe further away from communities, right? Not right next to a development, but, um, and then we need to be doing prescribed fires from that end. So from the end of the communities right next to people's houses, that's where we need to do you know, these fuels reductions and prescribed fires. And then hopefully those two things sort of come together at some point on the landscape. Um, we may need to also do prescribed fires in more remote places if we want to determine the outcome of wildfires. So if we don't wanna lose big trees, maybe we need to thin and burn around some of those big trees in dry forest types. I'm not talking about Western cascades, things get more complicated because it's wet and all of that. But we might need to bring the forest back to what it used to be like in some of these places if we, if we wanna keep big trees, if we wanna keep healthy watersheds and so on. Um, it's possible to do big prescribed burns. Two years ago, they did a 10,000 acre burn on the Fremont Wyneema National Forest with helicopters, you know, so that's possible too. But I also encourage small landowners to burn five acres, you know, get together with their neighbors and learn how to do it and get a permit with ODF and talk to their fire department. And, you know, that's part of that needs that that's all needed. So all you're, needed. you're saying um, that if people live in a woodland uh, neighborhood where they, many of them have large pieces of land, if they want to protect that, they might be able to get together and get a permit and, and learn from who, who's going to teach them how to, to do a prescribed burn. Well, <laughs> um, so that there are a lot of people who have fire knowledge. I mean, there are a lot of firefighters who are happy to contribute their knowledge, especially during the off season, right? when they're not off fighting fires. But you have the OSU Extension Fire Program is available to answer people's questions about prescribed fire. We have organizations, as we've mentioned, um, you know, the Long Tom Watershed Council is, they're really focused on working with tribes, but you have other watershed councils and, that have resources that they wanna contribute towards helping um, private landowners. At the end of the day, it has to come from private landowners themselves. People have to come together, have to form a group, and then they have to start banging down doors because if we don't hear from people, then we assume they're not interested. And these agencies are more than happy to not help people if the people are not seeking that kind of help. So, but if people you know, make the case that this is something they wanna do, uh, we can certainly use more uh, prescribed fire very safely on private lands um, with the appropriate training and sharing of equipment um, and coordination with fire departments and agencies. And, and um, is there any, have you heard of any effort? Do you agree with the zoning 
requirements in some of these places, especially in California, where if you can't build a house unless you learned how to do defensible space and you have to have a certain kind of roof and you can't put your wood deck all the way around it. Um, do you hear of any of this kind of um, legislation happening in Oregon? Well, it is happening in Oregon. The SB 762, the omnibus bill, uh, did include requirements to define the wildland urban interface, and there will be requirements um, under certain conditions for landowners, you know, to meet those criteria of defensible space. So that is happening right now. It's getting rolled out. I've not been very involved with it myself, but um, folks at the Office of the State Fire Marshal and the Oregon Department of Forestry are involved with that. And uh, resources will be coming out to educate landowners. They're not trying to go out and punish people. They just wanna educate people first and foremost. Correct, excellent, sounds good. <laughs> That's part of the answer there, Anne, <laughs> education. And Anne's an educator, so she can relate. <laughs> I, I have a sort of a comment Let's see, I don't know if I'm on. Go ahead, Carolyn. Ah, hi. This isn't exactly, well, it may be indirectly related to cultural burning. Um, I just have sort of an inkling of, a, of an asset for anyone who's interested in burning. And that is that these same fire control agencies that perhaps have been excessively dedicated to fire suppression in the past, Still, the reality is they have to do management and protect life and home. And my inkling is that engaging these agencies in a training mission is a great way for them to get real life hands-on training and achieve prescribed burns. So I'm just throwing that out there for anyone that's thinking about it. And for the record, we actually did a prescribed burn at Baltimore Woods. It was uh, probably eight or 10 years ago now. And um, one thing I also learned about prescribed burns is that it, at least the ones that I've ever been around, they're incredibly dependent upon very precise weather conditions. So in other words, they could easily be called off or rescheduled if, if conditions aren't exactly as expected or needed. But um, yeah, I think it's a very worthy goal. I, I think we're overdue for it. And um, having spent a lot of time in Central Oregon, we've seen a lot of these areas that have been opened up by prescribed burns. And just for me, there's something uncomfortable about forests that haven't been thinned at all, that are really dense. It just looks like it worries me for what that's worth. Yeah, no, I think that that's, that's great. I like to hear that because I feel that way too. You know, I drive around and well, you can see those unthinned places don't stand a chance in a wildfire. Um, Nor would a firefighter. No, well, they wouldn't go there. They would just not even, yeah. So what happens when we have these big wind events and we, we have not just some regular fuel, we have ancient tree pieces of fuel everywhere, like uh, pickup sticks. And how, how long is it going to take to remove these things? Are we just going to let them... What, what should they be doing in places like these um, forest cabin developments, you know, out in the middle of nowhere where the people have these leases with their cabins and then they've got all these trees down all around them. They are just waiting for a fire, aren't they, to come right through? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you're really concerned about structures, certainly the best thing is to follow those defensible space requirements and make sure you've got a metal roof and you've emptied out the gutters and you don't have anything flammable touching the building or within five feet and uh, you have double paned windows and et cetera and so on and so forth, you know, and that's really the best thing you can do if you don't have control around the environment uh, around you. One other thought, something I thought you might focus on more in the talk, again, having just been out in Central Oregon where there were severe burns, um, mm -hmm. I, I took a picture out of moving car of all the lupin that's growing on Highway 22 along the roadside. Um, the regrowth of flowers after fire is very interesting. And 
so many of the areas that were two years ago black with black toothpicks are now green with black toothpicks <laughs> and the regeneration is really encouraging mm -hmm. yeah yeah it is and you know a lot of times wildfires have benefits like i said too and environmental uh, benefits yeah. for sure yeah environmental benefits and it's a matter of scale it's a matter of um where is the nearest live tree you know if you have miles upon miles of dead trees then you've lost some species for sure i mean pines are not going to come back they have big seeds that fall within one or two lengths from the parent tree so that's not very far um and you know of course old trees are irreplaceable so if you burn some of these places that ironically you have these trees that probably saw dozens and dozens of fires in their younger lives uh, but then they all got encroached by other species like firs and incense cedars and now it goes up in smoke you can't bring that back that's never going to be the same you know so there's, we can't underestimate the damage as well. Um, some places will never look the same with the climate changing. Some species just won't come back in after, after a large enough, hot enough burn. But, you know, yes, yes, there are also benefits and it's, it's all a matter of scale. It's a matter of did that fire burn during the worst possible weather conditions? Or did it burn in kind of mild, cool conditions? I have a fire not far from here in the Applegate called the Burnt Peak Fire, and it is beautiful. It's uh, burned in 2017, and at the time there were a bunch of other wildfires, so they couldn't quite get to it. So they let it burn, not because they decided, but they just didn't have any firefighters. And the smoke, there was smoke from other wildfires coming over. So it was actually shading this little wildfire out because of all the smoke from the nearby wildfires, the Miller Creek, Miller complex. And so the fire burnt down from the top of the hill where it started from lightning and it just kind of, you know, burnt some patches and burnt along the ground in other places. And it's beautiful, it's, it's amazing but it burned under very specific weather conditions that are pretty much the kind of conditions we might've chosen to do a prescribed burn. And under other conditions, it would have had a very different outcome. That's really interesting. Have you talked to the native people or do they ever bring up the, uh, the other species, the mammals, the rep reptiles, the... Uh, Aquatic animals, are, are they given a little bit more of a chance to get on the run when they have a, the, the cultural burns? They're, they're smaller. They give some time like the, the deer could escape. I mean, they obviously didn't want to kill their, their mm -hmm. game. So that, was that one thing that they ever talk about? For sure. Um, I mean, I've never gotten into a conversation about reptiles, I have to say. Maybe that's something I'll, I'll, I'll earmark for the future, but um, most of the time when we do burns, there are sort of best practices in any case. Like for example, don't like a, light a big ring of fire that's gonna burn inwards because the animals don't have anywhere to go. Um, under rare circumstances, we might do that. Like if there's an open grassland and you can see that there aren't any animals, and any large mammals that you can see at least, uh, you might do that for various purposes. Um, but that's just an example of something we try not to do. We start at the top, you know, and, and it's very slow. The flame lengths are usually very short. Any large animal like a deer can jump over the flames. A human could walk over the flames most of the cut most of the time, unless you're burning big manzanita shrubs or something, but we don't tend to do that. Um, so and we, we walk, you know, across back and forth, lighting it little by little. It's actually quite boring, um, these fires. When people see it, sometimes it's like, oh, I thought it was going to be more exciting. And No, we write a plan and we say, you know, this is how we're going to do it. And then literally that's how we do it. And people are like, oh, oh, I thought we were going to run around a little bit more, like, you know, kind of light it up and then chase it around for a while. And no, it's not like that. Um, and I'm sure that 
you know, when indigenous people burn in days gone by, they probably had a very good awareness of how wet the conditions were, you know, and how fast the fire would go and where it would stop when it reached a different ecosystem and so on and so forth. So I'm not worried about the animals in, in prescribed burning. I, I know that they really like the conditions afterwards and um, I found occasionally a dead snake or dead lizard on a prescribed burn, but overall, I think that they can get out of the way. And um, in any case, they like having their environment be well taken care of, taken, yeah, tended. Thank you, very good points. I knew they had it covered. They, they're thinking about everything, thinking about it in a holistic way. It's, it's mm -hmm. their home too. Everything that's there, you're aware of it. So we probably need to uh, wrap this up. We have a recording that lasts about two hours and then it sort of goes poof. <laughs> and we're hoping that we can uh, share this on our YouTube channel. Is that gonna be good with you, Chris? Did we ask you that? Yes, yeah. that's fine. Mm -hmm. All right. we'll, we'll be having this put up on our uh, website for many people to view later. Great, great. Thank you so I much. Appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all. And um, I appreciate your work promoting native plants. And uh, you know, one of these days, let's, uh, let's go to one of those lupin fields and uh, do a field trip, shall we? Yeah, yeah. well, certainly we, we can come down to the Applegate Valley. We, were, we had an annual meeting in Williams. It was fantastic. Yeah. 2019. Yeah. So you're getting lots of uh, comments and uh, congratulations down there in the uh, chat, Chris. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, everyone. For a wonderful presentation that I know I certainly will watch again. <laughs> and uh, please join us on some of our future Zooms as well. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Good luck. Good luck in the future. Bye. Thank you.